Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tony Deval, and welcome to this Global ACS webcast. I'm joined today by Marie Kling, Sandra Thompson, and Gary Berkowitz. Our plan for the next 45 minutes or so is to continue our discussions on the issue that's most relevant to our stakeholders at the moment. And that's the accounting implications of the uncertainty created by the coronavirus and the uncertainty created by both the measures taken to control the spread of the virus and to support businesses and economies. In our previous discussions in May, we talked about lease concessions, the depreciation of assets and valuations. Today, I'm going to ask Marie, Sandra and Gary to talk about accounting for expected credit losses outside of banks, so trade receivables and so on. A model for thinking through the implications of government assistance, developments in connection with lease concession accounting, and presentation. We'll start by talking about something that'll be particularly important for 30 June 2020 reporting, and that's expected credit losses for non-financial businesses. The key question is how those businesses should adjust their ECL models in the light of COVID-19. Marie, perhaps you could talk about this. That's right, Tony. There's been a lot of focus on the impact of COVID-19 on ECL for banks, but it certainly affects corporates too for their trade receivables, their other receivables, or even their contract assets. So let's start with the overall impact. Um, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on economies and companies' operations, and it's undeniable that the economic environment has changed dramatically and that the impact of that change on ECL needs to be considered. So in simple terms, you can't ignore what's there. But before moving on to the ECL, I'd like to just give a quick reminder on scope. So ECL covers credit losses. So those are the losses due to the debtor's inability to pay. And as a result of COVID-19, some companies may actually give customers a discount on goods and services because of customer disputes, inefficiencies, or sales incentive, for example, in a difficult trading environment. Now, those discounts were not required by the sales contract. And if such discounts are not due to credit risk of the debtor, they're not within the scope of the ECL. And so what they would be subject to the scope of IFRS 15 revenue, and as a result, would be presented as adjustment to the revenue line. Now, that's in contrast to credit losses, which are presented as a separate line item, um, such as provision for bad debts, for example. But let's focus on uh, the ECL side. And there's really two areas in the current environment um, that I'd like to emphasize. The first one is groupings of receivables. The second one is inclusion of forward-looking information into your loss rate. But let's start with the grouping of trade receivables. Now, COVID-19 will have a more significant impact on some trade receivables versus others. And therefore, the groupings that were used previously may no longer be appropriate. Now, what groupings are appropriate will depend on the particular circumstances, but also the driver of credit losses. Now, this may include a variety of factors. For example, the in industry sector. Uh, for example, you have an entity selling food products. They may need to subdivide that into restaurant chains and grocery stores. Another factor is the geographical location of the debtor. Is the debtor located in a region under lockdown or not? Other factors are the nature of the product that's sold, um, the existence of any guarantees or even credit insurance, but also government relief programs. Now, uh, where the impact of COVID-19 on particular receivables is individually significant, these may actually be looked at individually. So that could be an example of a material debtor that is known to be in financial difficulty. Now, what about forward-looking information? Um, that's the next area of emphasis. Management might have previously measured ECLs using primarily historical data, such as historical loss rates, combined with data as at the reporting date, such as days past due, for example. Often, a provision matrix is actually used in practice. Now, that approach might have been taken on the basis that really in a stable economic environment, the adjustment for forward-looking information was not material. However, in light of COVID-19, this may no longer be the case. And so your historical data, such as the loss rates, may not need to be adjusted. Now, given the substantial uncertainties arising from COVID-19, determining how to quantify the impact of forward-looking information can certainly be challenging and judgment will have to be used. 
So entities will use, need to use their best efforts to understand what's most meaning, meaningful from a forward-looking perspective and incorporate that into the analysis. The short is there's no one size fits all. So what can companies do? Well, as a starting point, management might actually be able to look to historical information, such as behavior of customers during previous recessions. That could be done to establish economic data, such as GDP, unemployment rates, that correlate with losses. The company could then use those current forecasts of data, estimate the impact of future economic conditions on ECL, on your expected credit losses. Now, what's key to remember is that that data should actually be consistent with the data used for other purposes, such as the impairment on non-financial assets, recoverability of deferred tax assets, or even more broadly, the assessment of going concerns. Now, let's take an example of an entity that's selling products to individual homeowners. The key driver of credit risk for the resulting receivables may indeed be unemployment rate. And so the entity may be able to develop a model to estimate the impact of expected unemployment rates on its current receivables. Now, in establishing the link to the economic data, further complexities may actually arise due to what I call a lag. And let's take another example. Let's, let's, uh, we're looking at an electricity provider. Now, a rise in unemployment might not trigger an immediate increase in defaults because customers may prioritize paying electricity bills over other discretionary expenditures. Now, the increase in unemployment might only trigger a rise in loss rate, for example, if it is sustained for a six month period. Now, the lags is another variable to consider in that historical analysis with economic variables. And frankly, sometimes there may be insufficient historical data on the entity's own receivables to develop a meaningful analysis. So for example, a company may be selling to the restaurant industry, but it may not have a historical precedent for restaurants being closed due to a pandemic. And in this case, further industry research may actually help. For example, what are industry analysts forecasting the impact on restaurants to be? And are there any other studies um, considering expected loss rates? Last but not least, to the extent management is not able to fully reflect the impact of COVID-19 in its models, additional adjustments, we sometimes call them overlays, will also need to be considered. So that's what I wanted to cover um, for ECL for corporates. Now, another thing we've seen uh, or had a lot of questions on recently is government assistance. And I'm going to ask Gary uh, to tell us a little bit more about what steps one can actually follow when approaching COVID-19 government assistance. Thanks, Marie. Um, so as you say, we, we've received uh, several questions on a, on a multitude of reliefs over the, the past couple of months. And it's taken us a bit of time, but I, I think we're at the stage now where where we think we've uh, working through a, these IS-20 questions um, using a, a six-step framework might be helpful. So let me run through the, the six steps uh, to successfully navigating through, through a government grant, grant question. So step one is to determine whether the relief received is a government grant based on the definition and the scope of IS-20. Now, in many cases, this may be straightforward, um, but we are seeing some examples when, when this is more challenging. For example, in some cases, differentiating between a government grant and, and general government fiscal incentive programs can be challenging, or determining whether an incentive is an income tax, which is obviously scoped out of IS-20, or it's an indirect tax, which, which can be in the scope of IS-20. So I guess the, the key takeaway from, from step one is, is just to remember that just because it's the government that's trying to help entities doesn't always mean that, that you're in the scope of IS-20. We then go to step two, which is who is the beneficiary and determining whether the entity receives the government grant or whether or not it rather facilitates the transfer of that relief to the end party on behalf of the government can sometimes also be tricky. So again, another step where, where folks might be saying, you know, isn't that obvious? Uh, however, you know, again, we, we've seen some forms of, of government assistance in which the conditions and the process around the relief are so restrictive that we've concluded that that intermediary does not actually control the grant um, and therefore they, uh, they wouldn't actually apply IS-20. Instead, they act as an agent on, on behalf of the government 
and it's actually the end party that would apply IS-20 if, if they're a reporting entity. Again, I think the, the key message from this step is, is that an intermediary shouldn't automatically assume that, that they apply IS-20 if they're, if they're a, a party to a government relief scheme. So let's assume we, we're kind of, we're happy that uh, it's a government grant, I, I am the beneficiary. Um, we then get to step three, which is looking at the reasonable assurance criteria in IS-20. And there's really two criteria related to this. And the first is that the entity should have reasonable assurance that the entity will comply with, with any conditions attached to the grant. And this now, you know, will obviously depend on the specific facts and circumstances and on, on whether or not there are any conditions. And if, and if so, judgment sometimes will need to be applied to determine whether or not the entity has that reasonable assurance of compliance. The second criterion uh, that sits in, in the step is the entity needs to have reasonable assurance that it will actually receive the grant. Now, in some cases, again, this may be um, easy if you've already received the cash, but in some cases, you may not yet have received the cash. And if that's the case, you know, you'll need to have a think about things like how far along is the government in granting the relief or putting the package in place, making it clear what the conditions are that uh, you need to comply with to qualify. Um, and if there are conditions, whether or not the entity actually will qualify uh, for that relief based on how they've been defined. And again, in some cases, um, you might need to apply a bit of judgment there. So let's maybe move on to the next slide then. Um, and now we're, we're comfortable that it's a government grant. Uh, we've met the criteria for recognition. Um, then we get to step four, which is really when you actually decide how you're going to recognize, or rather, this is still when you recognize it. Before you can do that, you actually need to identify the expense or the economic loss that the grant is intended to compensate for. And you need to consider how that expense or economic loss is actually recognized in PNL based on the applicable IFRS standard for that, for that expense. So once you've worked out what expenses is trying to compensate and you've gone to the related IFRS standard and you've worked out, okay, it's recognized over time, then you can recognize the grant uh, in profit or loss in a manner that matches the pattern of recognition for the related expense or economic loss. So kind of step three and four is, is, is recognition. Then we get to step five, which is about presentation. And here folks will recall that, that IS-20 has a policy choice for, for the types of government grants that we, we're generally seeing here, in grants related to income. And yeah, there your policy choice is that you can recognize the grant on either a gross or a net basis. So, so what does that mean? It means um, you either, you've kind of got the cash, you in debit cash, credit to government grant liability. And when you when you want to recognize that grant now related to the expenses, you can either show that grant as other income, so on a gross basis, or alternatively, you can net that credit off against the related cost and therefore you would effectively show the cost on a, on a net basis, so gross or net. I think another point I'd just like to make here is that if the entity has had grants in the past unrelated to COVID-19 and they've chosen a particular presentation option, uh, we've thought about this and we don't think that that necessarily means that you're forced to apply the same policy to any COVID-19 related grants that you might be eligible for. So I think there, there's a judgment and you might end up having a different policy gross versus net presentation, depending on how similar the grants um, are to each other. So we've kind of done recognition, we just did presentation, and then always the last step is disclosure. And so here are just some things to think about specifically in IS-20, um, presenting what to, or disclosing the policy choice that you've made uh, with, respect to, with respect to the presentation option you've chosen. If there were any critical judgments that the entity needed to apply related to any of the previous steps I've gone through, disclosing the quantum of any grants that were recognized in the period, and also any conditions or uncertainties that, that readers need to be aware of. And specifically here, we think it would be useful to let readers know how long a government grant relief program might last for, because I think at the moment folks are doing pretty well while the government is, is supporting, but I think there is a, a degree of uncertainty with respect to when that uh, relief or support might end. So that's, uh, that's a six step uh, framework to hopefully success. Thanks, Gary. Uh, perhaps I can now ask Marie to comment on a specific topic in this area. Uh, many entities have benefited from financial support provided by central banks. What specifically should management consider to determine the accounting if it receives financial support from a central bank in response to COVID-19? Thanks, Tony. Um, that's right. 
um, central banks may actually lend directly to qualifying entities such as small businesses, or they may provide funding to commercial banks that then lend on to their customers. So following the steps that um, Gary just described, our first question would be, is there a government grant? Now, a central bank falls within the definition of a government entity under IS-20. So the key question is, is the funding arrangement provided on market terms? And this can be judgmental. And to make that determination, entities should consider the rate for a similar instrument, that is similar currency, maturity, type of interest, collateral, credit rating, or other terms. So when the funding is on terms that are not on market, for example, a below market interest rate, then again, in the absence of other factors, such as the provision of separate goods and services, there likely is a government grant for the difference between the market rate and the rate on the loan. The next question then is who's the beneficiary? Now, in some cases, the commercial bank may actually have significant discretion over how that funding is lent on to its customers. Uh, which customers does the bank lend the money to? What is the amount of the loan, interest rate, repayment terms, and collateral? But also the timing of issuance of the loans to the customers as compared to the receipt of the funding from the central bank. Now, in such a scenario, the commercial bank may be viewed as the beneficiary of the grant, even though ultimately its end customers will also benefit from the favorable funding. Now, in other cases, a commercial bank might lend to a customer at a market rate, but the central bank might make some of the payments that are actually due, for example, interest payments due for the next 12 months. In that scenario, the party who benefits from the grant is the customer who is relieved from its obligation to pay interest for the first 12 months under the loan. And the commercial bank really is only collecting the interest to which it is entitled to under the loan from the borrower. Now, the next step is, is there reasonable assurance? As Gary mentioned, there needs to be a reasonable assurance under IS-20 before a government grant is recognized. Now, usually uh, when a loan at a favorable rate has been advanced, there's rarely doubt unless the rate can be changed if certain conditions are not met. So the next question then is, what is the accounting? The government grant is recognized separately from the loan. And the loan is initially recognized at its fair value, plus or minus transaction costs. So the grant will be measured as the difference between the initial carrying value of the loan and the amount lent. In subsequent periods, the government grant is recognized in profit or loss on a systematic basis, usually over the period in which the entity recognizes the expenses that the grant is intended to compensate. So if the grant, for example, compensates for lower interest income on loans, it would be recognized over time as interest income is recognized. And the last point is when government grant is applied, um, there also are disclosures that need to be provided about the nature and extent of the grant. So um, next I wanna turn it over to Sandra, who um, mentioned in our previous webcast that the ISB intended to use an amendment to IFRS 16 for COVID-19 related rent concessions. So Sandra, can you give us an update on that amendment and maybe explain some of the questions we've been receiving around the accounting for rent concessions? Yeah, thank you very much, Maureen. As you said, we covered rent concessions on our last webcast, and I think we mentioned then that an amendment was likely coming. Well, it's here. So what does it say? Um, just to recap on what's the issue. In the light of COVID-19, we're seeing many rent concessions on leases. Now, there are many different forms and shapes of these, but they broadly fall into two categories. The first is a rental waiver. So some of the rents are actually forgiven. Um, and then the second is a rent deferral. So the, the rents are still due, but they're due later than they otherwise were. And as I said last time, it can be complex to figure out how to account for such rent concessions. Um, and in particular, for the lessee, whether that rent concession is a modification or whether it's one of the other options I ran through last time. I'm both figuring out whether it is or is not a modification and then doing the accounting as it is a modification can both be quite complex and practically quite tricky. And the ISB recognised this, so they have amended IFRS 16 um, for lessees to give them an optional practical expedient not to do that assessment. So you don't need to think about is it a modification or not, 
but rather you can account for the rent concession in the same way you would if it were not a modification. And I'll go on to what that means. Um, there are some conditions for getting into the optional practical expedient. So the rent concessions needs to be COVID-19 related. And then it also needs to, needs to meet three conditions that are in the amendment. Um, so the first is that the revised consideration is substantially the same or less than it was before. The second is that any reduction in lease payments happens before June 2021. So if you like, it's time limited. And then the third is there's no substantive change to the other terms and conditions. So, for example, you haven't changed the scope of the lease and, for example, how many floors of a property are leased. And if you meet all those tests, then it is an optional expedient, so the lessee can apply it. In terms of what it would mean, well, let's go back to my two examples. Let's start with the case where lease payments are actually waived. So let's suppose a lease payment of 100 is waived and is not due at all. Um, under the, the practical expedient, that would most likely be accounted for as variable lease payment. And that means the lessee would book again for the, the 100 that's been waived and the present value of that 100 and reduce the liability. And it would do that when whatever triggers the rental waiver happens. Um, the other case is a rent deferral um, and the accounting similar. So the lessee will book again and a reduction in the liability. But because the rent's still due, it's just deferred. The amount of the gain is just the present value effect, so the present value of deferring it from, say, next month to whenever it's now due. And that would typically give you a smaller gain. Um, and of course, there are some disclosures that would need to be applied as ever if the amendment is adopted. So have you applied the amendment? What have you applied it to? Um, what, what's the impact on the income statement of rent concessions granted? So I guess the next question is, well, when can lessees do this? It's very favourable and optional practical expedient. So we think many lessees will want to apply it as soon as possible. And the good news is you can apply it straight away. So it's mandatory for annual periods beginning on or after the 1st of June 2020. So you don't have to apply, it's optional, but if you do, that's the latest date. But you can early adopt. Um, and what that means is that the lessee can apply it to any financial statements that had not yet been approved for issue at the time the amendment was released, which is the 28th of May. So, for example, if a lessee had not yet approved its March 31 financial statements as of the 28th of May, regardless of whether those are annual or interim financial statements, it can apply the optional practical expedient. And I say we think many lessees will want to. That is, of course, subject to any endorsement in your local territory. OK, so that's lessees. Um, the other area we're getting a number of questions on is lessors. Um, now, lessors don't qualify for this practical expedient. It is restricted to lessees only. So we're asking many lessors are saying, well, then how do I count for COVID-19 related rent concessions? Um, and similar to I said last time, there could be a number of options, and I'm going to work through those with some, some, some examples. So let's take the first case where a lessor reduces some rents for a future period. So maybe um, towards the end of March, a lessor said to a lessee, I'm going to forgive the payments that would otherwise due in April and May. And let's suppose that's an amount of 100. Um, I think the first thing you'd need to ask is, well, is there anything in the contract that required that rent forgiveness? Or is there anything in related laws or regulation or government action? And if so, then you might say, well, that's not a modification because nothing in the contract has changed. So therefore, you might think that is um, variable lease payments. And if you reach that route, then the lessor would book a loss for the 100 at the time whenever what triggers that rent forgiveness happens, very similar to the lessee. If the rents are reduced, but there's nothing in the contract or applicable laws, regulations, etc., then you might be in a different case. Because that would require the contractual terms to be changed, that might look more like a lease modification. And under IFRS 16 for a, an operating lessor, you would spread that forwards. So you'd spread that loss of 100 forwards over the remaining term of the lease. So you can see that's very different from taking it up front. If we then flip over to a rent deferral, so now the, front, the rents are not reduced, they're just deferred, it's likely in that instance there will actually be no impact. For an operating 
rating lease, most lessors spread the nominal rent due over the, the life of the lease. So if the same nominal amounts are due, they're just due later, and the lease term hasn't changed, there is actually no impact at all. So you can see that's different again. And then if I come on to my fourth case, which is where past rents have been conditioned, have been forgiven. So if you take my example, um, and let's say in March, the lessor agreed to defer the rents that would be due in April and May. Um, and that happens and it's invoiced those payments, so it's booked to rent receivable for them. Um, but then get to June and the lessor decides that they are going to forgive those two months of rent, that 100. Um, here, there's probably two things you might do. So on the one hand, you might say, well, that's a change to the contractual conditions. That's a lease modification. Something's been modified or changed. And that would require spreading forward that impact of 100 over the remaining lease term. On the other hand, you might say, well, there's actually been a rent receivable recognised and rent receivables are in the scope of IFRS 9's derecognition requirements. Um, so that means I derecognise the rent receivable and that would give rise to an immediate loss on derecognition. So you can see for a lessor, it's a lot more complicated. There's at least three different answers you might get to, depending on the facts and circumstances. And in the last case, there's probably a policy choice, which means it's really important that lessors do disclose what accounting they've done, what accounting policies they've, they've, choose, they've chosen to adopt, and any judgments they've made. <clears throat> Thanks, Sandra. Now, we've talked a lot on these webcasts about recognition and measurement, and we've done pretty much the same today. But presentation is also an important consideration as we approach 30th of June reporting. So, Gary, how are entities reporting the effect of COVID-19 in their financial reports? What does IFRS say, and do you have a sense of what the regulators think? Thanks, Tony. Yeah, so there are there are a number of presentation options that uh, entities might be considering as a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, some options are allowed or actually encouraged under IS1, uh, whereas others are, are maybe more akin to in, internal management performance measures and, and might even be considered to be pro forma information. So let me maybe start with a type of presentation that would be what I call um, on the fairway to use a golfing analogy and uh, can maybe get into the rough or out of bounds as, as we go along. So starting with, uh, with subtotals and extra headings and the income statements, IS1 permits disaggregation uh, and additional line items in the income statements if that presentation is relevant to the understanding uh, of the entity's financial performance. The guidance in IS1 also requires separate disclosure of material items of income and expenses, and that might uh, include presentation in the income statements as well. So as a result of that, you know, additional line items, subtotals, um, or headings that represent the, the incremental costs as a result of COVID-19 might be acceptable, but <laughs> provided, you know, it comes with a caveat, that they give more understandable information and, and they don't actually obscure other material information. And in making this type of determination, it might be useful um, to bear in mind some of the other helpful guidance in IS1, which expands on this. And it says that any subtotals, line items, or extra headings uh, should, and there's four things here, they should be comprised of items made up of amounts that are recognized and measured in accordance with IFRS already. They should be presented and labeled in a manner that is clear and understandable. Uh, they should be consistent from period to period. And they shouldn't be displayed with any more prominence than, than any other subtotals or, or totals required by, by IS1. And here I think a, a key point to stress, moving on to the next point on the slide there, is, is the concept of consistency. So if you have an existing policy for presentation, I think you really need to consider carefully why it needs to be amended as a result of COVID-19. And, and similarly, if you're thinking about developing a policy for the first time for presentation to address some of the exceptional items that have arisen as a result of COVID-19, you need to also bear in mind that this policy would then need to be applied consistently um, by the entity in the future. So I guess maybe the key message on, on, on this point here is think really carefully before changing your existing presentation approach and maybe ask if, if a better idea might be to explain the impact of COVID-19 through disclosures and other public communications to investors. So if we move on then and looking at some of the options on, on where we are on the golf course, um, provided that the principles in, in IS1 are complied with, uh, 
you know, there might be a number of acceptable ways of presenting this information in the income statement. And again, I'll just reiterate, in many cases, judgment is going to be required to determine if a proposed uh, presentation is acceptable. So we maybe run through one of the ones that we've decided is potentially out of bounds. And, and that's, you know, IS1 doesn't permit pro forma amounts. And I mentioned that before, but what I mean by pro forma is uh, items of uh, income and expenses that don't constitute amounts determined in accordance with, with the IFRS principles. And so an example there might be um, some folks have suggested um, presenting pro forma revenue um, that an, and, and this pro forma revenue is revenue that an entity would have earned if there was no negative impact as a result of COVID-19. Then you've got kind of COVID-19 adjustments and then the subtotal actual revenue. So I think there we've said that's probably not all, that's not allowed in accordance with IS1. However, we move back into the fairway. Uh, IS1 would allow an entity to present separately a significant impairment that's been recognized under IS36. Um, that may have been as a direct result of COVID-19. Now, some further examples of uh, material items that might be acceptable to draw attention to uh, as a result of COVID-19 might include uh, the incremental costs of acquiring specific medical devices to protect employees, um, such as face masks, um, termination penalties you may have paid to suppliers as a result of needing to um, cancel supply contracts due to COVID-19, uh, debt modification expenses that you might incur uh, because you've had to renegotiate your financing again as a result of COVID-19, and maybe more generally write off of uh, deferred tax assets resulting from reduced expectations of taxable profits again as a result of headwinds introduced by, by COVID-19. Um, now there might be a, a mixture of factors impacting the entity's financial performance, and it might be difficult in some cases to separate the effect of COVID-19 from other external factors. So in some cases, for example, just the impact uh, of the reduction in commodity prices. And so the examples that I've just mentioned above might possibly be um, in the rough, because I think it'll depend uh, whether on the factor circumstances, um, whether or not it makes sense to specifically identify those items because they relate directly to COVID-19. And in such situations, management will likely need to apply judgment I think but what's really important here is that management clearly explains why a particular income or expense presentation is primarily as a result of COVID-19. Maybe one more out of bounds one that's worth mentioning would be consumption of, of existing assets uh, that were not able to generate income as a result of COVID-19. Now these expenses would generally not be included within additional line items and, and this is because it's the lost income that's the exceptional event as a result of COVID-19, rather than the costs that would have been incurred regardless of whether or not COVID-19 had incurred. So what I like to, I, I call these things sunk costs. So an example of a sunk cost might be the normal salary costs um, of employees whose productivity has been uh, negatively impacted as a result of COVID-19. And maybe moving on to the last point on the slide, which is our regulators' views. So. Regulators have been quite active in the space and they often have a view on the appropriateness uh, of the use of additional line items and, and pro forma information. And so regulated companies should exercise caution when departing from the standard IS1 presentation. And as I say, there have been a number of regulators who've been active in the space. The, the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA, uh, has issued some specific uh, guidance on alternative performance measures. Um, in their Q&A documentation and, and recently um, IOSCO also re uh, issued some really helpful guidance. So I think the point is there, you know, you, you really want to have a look if your regulator has, has, been having a, has been having a say in the space. So I think maybe I'll just end off this slide with, with uh, a key message being that if you want to present the impact of COVID-19 in a particular way in the income statements, number one, uh, ensure that you comply with IS1 and any regulator views. And number two, be clear about what you've done and why you've done it. And I think this is a good time to move on and talk about some of the questions you've asked us. The first one is for Sandra. And this reflects the fact that circumstances are changing quickly. So Sandra, how do you think about subsequent events in the context of an expected credit loss model? Yeah, and that's another question we've been getting quite a lot, particularly as, as entities get to reporting dates and, and face a cutoff issue. 
Um, so let's just talk through what the two standards are. This is kind of IFRS 9 meets IS 10. So IFRS 9 for impairment or expected credit loss, I'll call ECL, requires that that's a forward-looking estimate that's based on multiple scenarios. And that includes information about past events, current conditions, but also forecasts of future economic conditions. So you can see forward-looking here. So therefore what happens after the balance sheet date sounds like it might be relevant. If you flip over to IS 10, that says that if something happens after the reporting date, and if that something gives more evidence of conditions as up to the reporting date, then you include that in your measurement. So how do those two interreact? Um, I think it really comes back to what evidence was there about conditions at the reporting date, bearing in mind that for ECL, that's multiple forward-looking scenarios. And it might be easiest if I illustrate this with some examples. So let, let's take three different cases. Let's start with a case where some information becomes available after the reporting date, but clearly relates to conditions before the reporting date. So in the context of COVID-19, let's take an entity with a 30 June reporting date. And let's say on the 2nd of July, the government re releases some unemployment data for May. Now clearly unemployment levels in May is pre-reporting date. So that would be an adjusting event and that would be included in the ECL. So if that looks very different to say the base case that's been used in the ECL estimate, then you should be adjusting for that. If we go to the other end of the spectrum, my second case is something that happens after the reporting date that clearly is not related to periods before the reporting date. And probably the best example here, if we take an entity with a 31st December 2019 reporting date, and we think about the impact of COVID-19. As at the 31st December 2019, there were a very limited number of cases of an unknown virus that had been reported to the World Health Organization. There was no evidence of human to human transmission. Um, all that happened after the reporting date. So therefore, when you do your ECL as at the reporting date, most entities gave pretty much no weight to COVID-19. They probably, to be honest, more worried about ordinary seasonal flu because that was all post-reporting date. That's the correct treatment. And then of course, the more difficult cases, what about the in-between? So you might have some information that becomes available after the reporting date. It kind of gives you more information about what one of the possible scenarios in ECL might have been. So let's take an example here. Let's suppose again, we have an entity with a 30th June reporting date. Um, and then at the 30th of June, it was expected that government would review the current lockdown in three weeks time. You get to the 21st of July, that review happens and it becomes an awful lot more clear how lockdown is going to be eased, how those lockdown restrictions are going to be removed. Now, clearly when you were there at the 30th of June, there was some uncertainty, but it was clear the government was going to do a review in three weeks time. So when you did the multiple scenarios, that review needed to be brought into your multiple scenarios and taken account of. And of course, there were various things the government might have done and you would have modeled different scenarios and given them different weightings um, and they added them up. Now, when the government actually reviews the lockdown, that might give you a bit more evidence about what were the appropriate scenarios to think about or what the weightings might have been. It certainly wasn't the case that you knew what was going to happen as at the um, 30th of June, particularly when you're in a, an IFRS 9 multiple scenarios type model. Um, so therefore you wouldn't jump to say your only scenario is what actually happened. You might say tweak the scenarios, particularly if you hadn't contemplated this kind of restriction being lifted at all, that you might go back and think, well, actually there was reasonable evidence this was one of the possible scenarios. And that might be different from when the government does something completely out of the blue um, when it comes to announce restrictions. And then you might conclude, well, that wasn't reasonably one of the scenarios that you could have foreseen as at the reporting date. You see, element of judgment there. Okay, thanks Sandra, that's helpful. The next question is for Gary. Now, many entities have seen demand for their goods and services fall as a result of the pandemic, but their costs have continued at the same level or maybe even higher. Should all of these costs be recognised as an expense or can any of them be hung up on the balance sheet? Yeah, that's a, that's a fairly broad question, I guess, Tony. And, um, I imagine the types of costs folks might be thinking about here would be related to, to inventory, but um, many of the principles, I guess, would, uh, would apply equally to the directly attributable costs 
related to property, plants, and equipment as well. So, so each of those standards has has differing words, but I think they share they share a general idea, or the same principle, that if the costs were planned, uh, reasonably expected, or or I think the, the words in the standard normal, uh, an entity can continue to capitalise those costs. Whereas abnormal costs or wastage, as the as the standard refers to it, would not form part of the the cost of an item of of inventory or property, plants, and equipment. And they should be expensed in the period in which they occur. Now, it's probably fair to say that there's a, a high hurdle to cross to, to revise what would be considered to be the new normal, um, or what would be a normal expense or normal capacity as a result of COVID-19. And clearly concluding if and when there's a new normal is going to require judgment. And we've been thinking about this and maybe, maybe what might be helpful for folks is some of the factors that we've thought might be relevant in determining what might be the new normal uh, could include whether or not there are additional costs or are, are the additional costs reflected over a number of periods and are they included in the entity's long-term operational plans and budgets? Uh, are there ex expected changes in the nature of the business and or the industry? So if, if the result of COVID-19 has changed the industry as a whole, maybe that is the new normal or is it actually more bespoke or specific to the entity in terms of that change that, uh, or the additional expense that's been incurred. Um, another one is, has the expected allowable capacity or the activity levels or utilization of the facilities changed? Um, and is the cost uh, incurred expected to be on charge to the customer in due course? Because if it can be on charge to the customer, that might indicate that it has become part of your normal operating environment going forward as opposed to being a once-off cost. And maybe the last one would be, um, what is the expected duration of the measures and or policies set by, by the local government? So, uh, so sorry, Tony, no bright lines or, or silver bullets there, but, um, but I do think to the extent that entities have applied judgment in, in determining what is still eligible for capitalization during periods of reduced or, or zero production. Uh, again, disclosure of the judgment and, and its impact on the income statement and balance sheet will be key. Maybe one last thing to remember, even if you do end up capitalizing additional COVID-19 related costs into your inventory or your PPE, that might actually be an indicator of a potential NRV write down or an impairment that should be considered. So um, we should, and, and then actually also it's maybe worth mentioning, we should be coming out with some specific guidance on this in the near future. So if this is an issue for folks watching, I'd suggest checking back on our, our COVID-19 frequently asked questions in a couple of weeks or so. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, now for another change in direction. Uh, I think we have a good question here for Sandra. Um, I'm sure that many entities have been looking at different sources of funding and so forth as the pandemic has developed. Uh, and I see that the Interpretations Committee had a couple of agenda items this week relating to financing arrangements, and in particular, supply chain financing and sale and leaseback transactions. Sandra, uh, what did the committee have to say? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, so starting with supply chain financing, and I'll keep this brief because there'll be a separate IFRS talks on the whole of the IFRIC meeting, which will go into more detail. Now, I've mentioned supply chain financing before. It's been a hot topic for regulators and users for quite some time. And in the light of COVID-19, there's particular concerns about liquidity risk and what would happen if the, the programme was pulled and might the entity need alternative forms of financing. So it's kind of gone up the agenda in the light of COVID-19. The IFRIC agreed to issue a tentative agenda decision in four areas. The first is derecognition. So is the liability still a trade payable or is it something else? The second is balance sheet presentation. Should you present this as trade payable, other payable, perhaps bank financing? Does it need a separate line item all of its own if the, the nature and function is now changed and is now quite significantly different? The third area is cash flow statement. So are the cash flows operating or financing? You might look to the balance sheet to help with that. And then the final area, the fourth area is disclosures, particularly liquidity disclosures and the issue I mentioned of what happens if the arrangement's pulled, but also more broadly disclosures. That is a tentative agenda decision, but given the regulatory and user focus on this, I'd really suggest that companies do take a look at their current disclosures and presentations and think if they need to um, do some more in the light of COVID-19. 
And then the second area, as you said, Tony, is sales and leasebacks with variable payments. So let's take an example. An entity has a property, say a retail store, it sells it and then leases it back for say 10 years. But all of the rentals under that lease back are variable. Maybe they vary with turnover from the store. Now, the question is, what do you do in that circumstance? If that were a new lease, you would not book a right of use asset or a liability. But there are some very specific requirements now for a 16 for sale and lease backs. And the IFRIC final agenda decision will say that you do book a right of use asset and a lease liability. That's measured at the proportion of the, the property that's retained. Um, and you restrict any gain to the proportion that's not retained. Um, the agenda decision will not say what kind of liability that liability is or the subsequent accounting. That will be left for a narrow scope amendment that the board will consider making. But you definitely do book a right of use asset and a lease liability. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Now, I think we are just about out of time. So thank you to Marie, to Gary and to Sandra for your insights. Many aspects of accounting in today's environment are affected by the uncertainty about the future created by the virus. We've talked about some of these on our webcasts, for example, impairment, leasing, government grants and so on. We've also talked before about interim reporting. And I'm conscious that many entities with 30 of the June reporting dates might be reporting on the accounting impact of COVID-19 for the first time in an interim report. Now, it's really important for those entities to be aware of the need to allow enough time to work through and think about the issues arising from the virus and to prepare the interim report. I think it's important to remember that just rolling forward last year's template probably won't work this year. I'd also say remember that good disclosure will be key to explaining the impact of the virus. IS 34 requires that interim reports provide an update. And this year, more than any other, I think there's clearly a need for an update. We hope this webcast will help you as you navigate some of the key issues arising from the uncertainty created by the pandemic. Uh, if you have any further questions, we have various resources available to you, and you can refer to the links set out in the description below. Thank you very much.